Hey, hello everyone. I think we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's session, EU Falsified Medicines Directive, What to Know and Where to Start. Thank you for joining us today. I would like to get started by introducing today's presenter, Mark Davison. Mark is a leading traceability and digital health expert, as well as the published author of Pharmaceutical Anti-Counterfeiting, Combating the Real Danger from Fake Drugs. Mark specializes in global health and big data issues, such as serialization, supply chain security, patient safety, and government policy. Mark was voted onto Medicine Maker Magazine's power list of 100 most influential people in pharmaceutical manufacturing and development. He joined the RFXL team earlier this year as the Senior Operations Director for Europe, and we are excited to have him join us today and share his expansive knowledge on this topic. We welcome any feedback or questions during today's call. However, please note that you will remain muted for the duration of the call and that we will not be addressing any questions until after the conclusion of Mark's presentation. Along the right-hand side of your screen, you should see the GoToWebinar menu. At any time during the call, please feel free to post a question inside the appropriately labeled section of this display. I'm watching, um, my numbers jump up here a little bit. I've seen a handful of people um, joined since I, I started speaking. So again, um, welcome to those of you who just joined. As I stated, please note that questions will be addressed at the end of the presentation in order of their posting inside the display with GoToWebinar. Thank you again, and I will now turn control over to Mark. Enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Shelley, and good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us from. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. We're going to go through some of the aspects of the Falsified Medicines Directive. Um, just a quick disclaimer, I'm not going to have all the answers that you might want. I think uh, I, that, would, uh, that would be nice, but unfortunately, I don't I don't think anybody has that. I am going to hopefully highlight some questions that you should think about when you're making decisions in your project around this area. Most of the stuff I'm going to talk about is going to be around the software related reporting processes, not necessarily as much around the production line related uh, issues, although we will cover those uh, during the presentation. So uh, as uh, Shelley said, um, I'm head of Europe for RFXL. Uh, I'm a career um, life sentence in pharma, if you like. I started off when Smith Klein Beecham wasn't GSK, and I've also worked in uh, in CROs. And in the last 10 years or so, I've been working in traceability since well before any of these laws were written, actually, at the current crop anyway. And I think it's worth just doing a reality check that wherever we are today and however complicated and difficult it is, it's still better than it was back in the Wild West when there were no standards, there was no consensus on what we should do. Uh, today is, by, de by uh, comparison, uh, an easier um, place to be. So we'll look today at some key features of the Falsified Medicines Directive. What does that mean for you, whether you're a marketing authorization holder, um, that's loosely speaking a license holder for colleagues listening from the US, uh, contract manufacturer, a distributor, or a dispenser. We'll look at who should do what and when they should do it. And we'll try to unravel some of this thing around EMVO, and I'll explain what that is and why it's important. And I'll also try to demystify the business of how you connect your business to the European Medicines Verification System. And then we'll cover some practical issues. So what are the timelines that you need to think about? What resourcing needs should you think about in your organization if you're uh, buying some of the services and software and hardware that you need for these projects? How do you do validation? Um, this is not something where you get a free pass from the regulator. This is part of your validated GMP obligation. So that means it comes with certain obligations in terms of what you need to do and uh, we'll cover off any other issues. So just to think back, as I mentioned uh, back in the day, there were a number of different approaches to traceability and we won't do a history lesson here. Um, if anybody's particularly interested, they can Google this stuff. But I've just borrowed this slide from our friends at GS1. And GS1, for those of you who aren't members, has a really great healthcare public policy forum 
and if you're not members I recommend that you join because it's uh, it's a few thousand dollars very well spent and they have a regulatory radar that picks up the new upcoming requirements in different countries and it's their copyright information so I've stripped out the names of the countries here but you can see the proliferation of different things that have come out in the last seven or eight years and every week there's a different country with a different flavor luckily they are almost always a variety of GS1 based system so compared to uh, some time ago these are typically the same system that you need to cope with them the rules might be slightly different in each country as to how you uh, provide the information to that particular jurisdiction but the underlying infrastructure is usually broadly similar uh, which is great news for all of us specifically on the falsified medicines directive in Europe so back in June 2011 European directive 2011 62 EU which commonly known as the falsified medicines directive was published and um, nearly five years later the second piece of that came out which is so-called delegated regulation which really gave the rules on what specifically should be done with the pack and how that data should be printed how it should be managed where it should be sent how it should be verified and on that publication date there was a three-year adoption clock that started and that's pretty much run two years of its course now so uh, in not very long it's the one year pre-anniversary of the deadline so we have 12 months to get this done and that's pretty much across the European Union with the exception of three countries who had a pre-existing traceability system uh, it's a detail that we don't need to go into but it looks quite likely that those countries will not take the full allocation of six extra years that they were originally given under the law so you can expect a relatively uniform uh, European system uh, quite quickly after 9 February 2019 so what does that mean in terms of a marketing authorization holder so somebody whose name is on the pack as a license holder well the two important things from our perspective in terms of uh, the industrial side of what you have to put on the pack are a safety feature uh, on all prescription medicines with again some small exceptions which uh, which we won't go into but pretty much all prescription medicines to enable pack traceability at the unit of sale level so the individual pack that the patient receives anywhere in the European Union so um, that's what we would call serialization in other words giving every pack a serial number uh, as those of you in the US will know the European Union is much more common to pack things in the end patient pack rather than pack in bulk and then have the pharmacy uh, dispense the final patient bottle so because of that the system engineering in Europe can be a little different to the one in the US the second piece that's unique to Europe is the tamper evidence requirement so all unit of sale packs in the European Union must be tamper evident from that same date of 9th of February 2019 in other words the medicine must remain sealed between the manufacturer and the patient um, and how that's done is relatively flexible any of the the standard tamper evidence technologies would be enough but it is uh, an aspect that sometimes gets forgotten in the rush to serialize that you also need to make sure that you have a good way of making your packs tamper evident so moving on to the practicalities of what FMD means if we take the safety feature I'm going to leave aside tamper evidence the practicalities of tamper evidence are for another day um, and contact me if you'd like some more information but in terms of the safety feature the printed feature on the pack so every unit of sale pack must have one of these data matrix codes that you see in the middle there the familiar uh, square code with black and white dots and there are specific standards about how those are generated how they're printed there are specific standards about the numbering formats that they must have included within them and for the purposes of the falsified medicines directive at least four pieces of data must be included within that code and also printed um, next to it or in some cases uh, elsewhere on the pack um, and those are the global trade item number 
otherwise known as a GTIN in the jargon. So that's the name of the stock keeping unit, if you like. So the, the 40 milligram uh, presentation of product X for Spain will have a GTIN and the 60, 80 milligram packs will have different GTINs, etc. A serial number, which is the name of the individual pack within that SKU. So every pack coming down the production line has a different serial number and then batch number and expiry date, which we already print, but will be amalgamated into these codes. As noted there, some countries will retain their national numbering systems. So there may be a requirement in some countries for a fifth element of data to incorporate that national reimbursement number. Again, the specific details would take us too long to go into here, but we'd be happy to help you out with some detail around those. Um, over time, I would expect those national reimbursement numbers to be phased out because once a full GS1 system of GTIN plus serial number is in place, a national reimbursement number can be inferred by a database lookup. It doesn't really need to be printed anymore because we have the unique identity of the pack already established. So I think we'll see um, a harmonization and a removal of those numbers uh, over time. Thinking about what that means, that, that if we go back one slide, that sounds relatively simple. The, the, the printing at the top there uh, is, it's well within the range of plenty of printers. Um, that doesn't look like it's a particularly tough task. The difference is that it changes the functionality and the philosophy and the way of doing things on the production line completely. Before you serialize a production line, every pack within a batch is indistinguishable. So that means that somebody can take samples, they can remove a pack to check it. Uh, if they destroy it, it doesn't matter. If they replace one with another one, it doesn't matter. After serialization, every pack becomes unique. That means that every pack has a number associated with it. And what happens to that pack and its number is important. It's not uh, replaceable with the ne next pack coming down the line without consequences. So that means that you have to have processes which control all of that and which make that uh, feasible, which allow you to know exactly what's happening to all of the data that you generate. One other thing that is frequently missed, and it's really more of a printing issue than it is a, a, an IT and data issue, is that the codes must be readable at the pharmacy for their whole shelf life. In other words, the common mistake that some manufacturers have made is to imagine that the well-lit, good quality production line printing and vision system that they have is representative of the conditions in a pharmacy. And a pharmacy is going to be not very well lit. It's going to have a, a camera scanner that's not such high resolution as your online equipment. So it's always good practice to make sure that your codes can be read with something that looks a bit more like the scanner that will be used at pharmacy. And the reason for that is that if the code can't be scanned, it will be returned. So non-scanning packs, even if they're perfectly genuine, are going to cause you a problem. So it's very well worth checking with your supplier that the codes are being printed to a sufficient quality on the production line and in a way that does not allow the code to be scuffed off or fade or removed in another way during normal logistic processes. So that's something that is mundane, um, but critical to how this works in real life. Every pack that doesn't scan will come back and there is, is therefore a lost sale. A quick word on aggregation. So aggregation, again, for those of you new to this subject, is basically building a hierarchy of codes. So instead of having to open every pallet, every shipper case, right down to each individual pack when you want to check something. If you've aggregated data, that means that you take a picture of the codes when you put them into a shipper case so that you know all of the codes that are within that box. You seal the box and you print another code on the outside of that box that allows you in the database to look up the codes within the box without opening. And similarly, when you aggregate shippers to pallets, you print a big code on the outside of the pallet that says, when you scan this code, all of these numbers will be contained within the shrink wrap of this pallet. You don't have to open it to find out. Really useful supply chain process. It's not mandatory, 
under the falsified medicines directive so it's a it's a pack level coding rule and in fact the european medicine verification system does not accept aggregation data so you don't have to pass along information about your higher levels of uh, architecture with your data you just have to pack along the pack in pass along the pack information having said that aggregation is really useful because one of the things that needs to be avoided if we think about this from a gmp perspective is any drift between the numbers that you create and the inventory that you create and i have been asked the question and i know some of my colleagues in consulting get asked the question should there, can we allow a tolerance our cmo would like to have one or two percent tolerance between codes and product well that's dangerous because where do those one or two percent codes go uh, that's you know that's that's not really a, a good way of doing things aggregation means that you have to tidy up after yourself because you know which codes were made you know which ones ended up in which box which box ended up in which pallet everything else can be discarded so it's very uh, tidy way of doing things it also means that downstream if you have internal hub operations where you've moved the product but you haven't sold it it's much easier to check that product when it goes to your hub because you can scan once um, and it just means shipping and receiving gets really quick so it's something to think about um, and certainly many of the biggest CMOs that we talk to are big advocates of aggregation for their customers because they think it adds value and in fact some of them have decided they will not just do serialization they will only do aggregated stock whether you use the information or not uh, is down to you but that's their policy choice and this boils down to the last bullet point I think that serialization is not some kind of bolt-on process that is outside of the quality mandates that you have to follow as a drug company it's an integral part of GMP so you're expected to be exact you're expected to know what happens with your information you're expected to be able to prove where stuff came from where it was used where it went and what happens to the ones that you didn't use so there are some fuzzy areas around the data handling and nowhere is it written that there must be a one-to-one -one reconciliation of codes and packs in the falsified medicines directive but common sense would tell you that that's the way that we should go and from my perspective doing something close enough is quite a risky approach you should be able to tell where your codes are and that's summarized on this next slide if we think about this philosophically today you make boxes or vials or syringes and you ship those around the world and they go to patients they get used they make patients better and that's what you're reimbursed for as a drug company by whichever payer it happens to be social health care commercial etc tomorrow that's only part of your product your product is actually drugs and data because under the falsified medicines directive and indeed under the drug supply chain security act in the us as well the product the physical inventory is not saleable unless the data associated with it is correct so if you mess up the data it doesn't matter what fantastic pharmacology you've invested in with your product you can't sell it so that's important to convey to senior management that this is not just a tick box this is a fundamentally different way of engineering a drug company a drug company is now really reliant on the data integrity that's generated or not during their serialization processes and that's pretty boldly stated in the FMD um, wrong data no sale So if we think about that in terms of financial speak and um, forgive the the consultant mode for a moment the return on investment curve for serialization does not begin at zero because if you don't spend anything you think let's not bother with serialization you're going to be hit with non-compliance penalties you can't sell any product so even just to get back to zero you have to spend money to do something about serialization by spending a bit more you go into the the positive side of the curve where you have an efficient 
solution that's adding value to your business. It's generating more value than it's costing you to implement. And then it's possible to uh, go too far and have costly, difficult to maintain, uh, expensive to validate solutions that start to dip below the line again. So you want to try to aim for that sweet spot. But I still frequently get uh, calls from people who say, well, we're just going to see how it goes. And um, you know, if, if it really gets hot, then we'll start to do something about it. That's a really dangerous game. And I'll come on to why uh, in a bit more detail later, but just to bear in mind that um, spending nothing is uh, a way to go out of business. So let's translate that into practicalities in the, in the supply chain. Who does what and when do they do that? So the next diagram I've borrowed from um, one of the uh, UK lobby groups. And, and this is from the UK um, FMD group in pharmacy, looking at how pharmacists should react to this stuff. So I, I acknowledge fully their role in, in this diagram. It's nothing to do with me. The, it's a really useful summary, though, of a typical supply chain. And it's for the UK, but um, most of the applications and the, the arrows will apply to other supply chains in Europe. And we see the thick pink arrow in the middle there is the general flow of the supply chain from manufacturing through to the coding step, uh, which we see here, putting pack codes on the box. Those codes are then uploaded to the EU hub, as it's colloquially known, the, uh, the database for the European Medicine Verification System. And then the product itself flows along through the supply chain, through wholesale and to pharmacy. Now, important to note, and I'll do this on a simpler slide in a moment, in the falsified medicines directive, it's not necessary to record every transaction as it is in the US system. So the, the THTITS thing in the Drug Supply Chain Security Act does not have an exact parallel in Europe. The mandatory pieces are manufacturer upload and pharmacist verification. The distribution chain checks the codes when they there's a need. It's a risk-based verification. So that might be if things are damaged uh, or expired or they've come from a non-standard uh, supplier that you haven't worked with before, for example. So all of those reasons might trigger a verification based on risk, but there are no mandatory uh, changes or, or uh, checking of the code in the normal supply chain. Clearly, exceptions might be a parallel trader. So a parallel trader would be taking one box out of circulation and replacing the code on that box with a new code that they are authorized to upload into the system. So that's an authorized legal business transaction in Europe. Parallel trade is perfectly legal across borders in Europe. In fact, it's illegal to prevent parallel trade. So again, a subject for another day, but that is allowed for in the way that the falsified medicines directive has been written to make sure that that is not inhibited in any way. Then on the right-hand side of the diagram, you see that there are various dispense-related processes at pharmacies, and the pharmacist uh, has 10 days to reverse that decommissioning. So in the normal stream of business, a pharmacist will take the pack, they will check the tamper evidence, they will scan the code, and that code will then be decommissioned from the verification system locally in their country, the NMVS, uh, National Medicine Verification System, which will then synchronize to, to the rest of the system. But that decommissioning says this pack has been dispensed to the patient and is no longer a valid code. It cannot be used again. Now, for example, in the case where they do that, expecting a patient to pick up the prescription, patient doesn't turn up or some other reason, the product can be returned to stock within 10 days and recommissioned. So that code can be put back into the system again. So there are all sorts of workarounds to enable the supply chain to function as it currently does. But as you can see from this diagram, the implications of the falsified medicines directive are wide and deep, particularly if your company acts as a wholesaler as well as a manufacturer, then that gets quite complex. Uh, we um, have talked to a number of customers with both of those requirements and, uh, and they really have a, a multifactorial problem on their hands. 
So that's a, a, an overview of a typical supply chain in Europe. And just to simplify that then for a moment, as I mentioned, the normal flow is relatively straightforward. And the rationale for that is that in Europe, if it was, if we tried to catch every transaction because of the number of cross-border transactions that occur, that would get very big and very floppy and very difficult. So hence the end-to-end -end system. Check at the beginning and check at the end and uh, don't check everything else in the middle. So how does all this infrastructure work and what happens and who do you interact with as a license holder? Well, we have this thing called the European Medicine Verifications Organization and uh, they have the European Medicines Verification System, which is the, the central EU uh, hub system, which then connects with a number of national verification systems. So as you see there, the manufacturer uploads their information centrally. The European system pushes that information down. Here we've taken the example of the UK to the national medicine verification systems which are relevant for that pack. So the master data associated with that pack will tell the hub whether it's a multi-market pack or whether it's a pack that's just for the UK or just for France or just for Germany. And the logic built within the system will push that information down to the relative countries who need to know that. Then, uh, as we see at the bottom here, the pharmacists and the hospitals and anybody else who needs to know will be uh, verifying against that local database within their own jurisdiction. So that ticks a number of boxes in terms of simplicity. It also uh, addresses some sensitivities around uh, local control and ownership of information within sovereign nations and, and their own jurisdiction. So that's the reason why it's engineered that way. But all of these interfaces are uh, thought through. There are um, actually only uh, two suppliers of the particular interface uh, of the national repositories, if you like. Um, so that is not as, uh, as heterogeneous as it could be, perhaps. In terms of how you interact with EMVO as an organization making medicines, there's a rather complex process on the EMVO website, um, which I encourage you to, to go and look through. The, the process is complex because each onboarding partner, which is effectively the equivalent of the parent organization in a drug company, it, it should register once with EMVO. So rather than having all of your affiliates within Europe register separately, you choose a parent organization to register once on behalf of all of those affiliates. And that means that you need to choose somebody to represent the organization in person as well, um, and the administration involved with that and the contractual side of that. So just getting that administration done uh, can take some time, um, and that's something just to plan for. Importantly, you can't delegate that registration with EMVO to a contract manufacturing organization. And I'll come back onto that in a moment because it's important in how we do business in the modern supply chain. So you can outsource almost anything in a modern pharmaceutical company, but you can't outsource your contractual obligations under the falsified medicines directive to upload information to the European medicine verification system. That's the responsibility of the marketing authorization holder, the license holder, with one small caveat that I'll mention later. So as I mentioned, there is a contractual onboarding. Um, you have to sign confidentiality, confidentiality agreements. You have to sign uh, contracts and usage agreements and so on. Um, that's a non-trivial activity. Um, typically, it takes a while, longer than you might think. So again, that's something that you can start with. Um, it's not necessarily on your critical path of the technical implementation, but it's something that you can start and get moving uh, relatively quickly. The sign-up process on the um, onboarding portal is very quick. And then it's down to you to collate all of the information. A couple of points to note, all of the agreements are non-negotiable. So you can by all means send them to your legal department. If they redline them, you're wasting your time. They're all non-negotiable, so uh, sign them or don't sign them. Um, 
people have been banging heads trying to get changes made and it, it doesn't work. So uh, that's just uh, unfortunately a cost of doing business. The technical onboarding uh, is in parallel. So as well as getting your company verified, and that's the reason for the contractual onboarding process is to make sure that there aren't uh, spoof or spurious drug companies created specifically for the purpose of accessing the EMBO system. So all of the identities of candidate drug companies are verified from GSK, Sanofi, Pfizer downwards to uh, very small virtual companies to make sure that they are actually a real company. The technical onboarding is the process of forming a link between your data and EMVO. So in that case, you need to find a solution provider or alternatively build a link yourself. Um, I haven't heard of many drug companies doing that, that. Most of them are going to external solution providers who can provide that access to EMVO. And there are a small number of certified software providers who are pre-certified have a link that they have built and certified to EMBO already. So in that case, you don't start uh, at the left um, blob here. You start somewhere to the end of the right blob. So you just need to do a, a small pre-certification or mini certification step, and then you can go into the production environment because we've done all the hard work previously. Um, and as I've noted there, RFXL is one of that small number of software providers who've already been through those hoops to make it easier uh, for you to get on board. Coming back to that question of contract manufacturing organizations, and this is one that um, I'm asked almost daily, um, can't my CMO do this? Well, in theory, yes. In practice, the falsified medicines directive clearly says that responsibility for data upload lies with the marketing authorization holder and EMVO will only contract with marketing authorization holders with a license holding drug company. So you cannot delegate the responsibility for your EMVO contract or for the accuracy of any data uploaded to it in your name. If you only use one contract manufacturing organization and if you trust them with your life, then you could potentially give them access to your login account for them to upload data for you. I wouldn't advise that, but there's nothing in the rules that says you couldn't get them to do that. There is only one login per EMVO access point, so you can't have 10 CMOs and have everybody upload their own information on your behalf. That wouldn't work. But if you're tiny, you have one CMO, it's possible. The red sentence there is really critical. The marketing authorization is responsible at all times and is the contract holder. Any error that the CMO makes is your problem, not theirs. So uh, as, uh, as a quality person, you, I would certainly recommend that you think twice about that option. So your CMO can't do it for you, except in very limited circumstances is a summary of, of that. The other gotcha that uh, people often have, um, surprisingly to me, is that they've got their heads around the variable data, the serialization piece, but they perhaps haven't spent the same amount of time getting their master data clean and ready and in the format that they need to be uploaded into the EMVO. So that's a project that you need to start in parallel. Um, even very basic things, um, making sure that your product, your SKU numbering system is actually based on GS1 standards and global trade item numbers, because you will need GTINs to upload into the EMVO system. So if you're not using a GTIN based system to number your product SKUs at the moment, you need to map and transfer those to do that. And EMVO has published a master data guide to help you with that. It's pretty straightforward and you can download it from the link that you see there. The second question after the CMO question is always the one about cost. Um, clearly there's a number of costs and they will vary depending on your particular circumstances. The production line costs, um, either for your own production line upgrades or your contract manufacturer costs that they will pass on to you are for printing and checking the codes. If you have production lines and you have not started a serialization program yet, um, you need to drop out of the webinar and go and get that going this afternoon 
because uh, time is really very, very short indeed. It's also the software for managing those serial numbers, both at the production line level and also at the enterprise level, and then reporting out of your organization up through to the, uh, the regulatory body, or in this case, the European Medicine Verification Organization. That's the, the costs to people like RFXL, the vendor costs, if you like. There are other external costs. The uh, EMVO itself has a one-time fee, which I'll come on to in the next slide. The National Medicine Verification Organization, so each country that you're working in, uh, where you have an entity, you will need to pay a locally determined fee to that NMVO. And if you have two entities in that country, let's say it's uh, you're a big company and you have two entities in France with different names, um, if they both have drug licenses, you need to pay the fee twice. And this again is a surprise to many small companies with small but with a wide spread of markets. The average fee can be 10, 15, 20,000 euros per marketing authorization per country per year. So if your entity uh, in um, Slovenia is linked to the Slovenian um, verification system, then that entity will be paying an annual fee to that repository organization and the same with all of the other countries around Europe that you're involved in. So those numbers can stack up and they're recurring. So in terms of your OPEX budgeting for this year and next, make sure that you figure out which countries you're liable for, what fee they're charging and what you need to roll into continuing budgets to make that work. The EMVO fee is relatively um, speaking lower. It's a one-off fee. Uh, the middle column is the relevant one there. The early, the left-hand one has now passed. So at the moment, if you're a uh, onboarding partner, i.e. drug company with uh, one uh, entity, then you're paying 4,500 euros one-time fee to EMVO and so on. That rises again in June by 50%. So uh, there's a good window of opportunity to, to get that sorted out now. There are a number of remaining challenges for EMVO. Um, this is actually quite a bottleneck. So there are a apparently 2,500 entities required to be onboarded to the EMVO system who will need to be compliant with the falsified medicines directive. At this stage, EMVO is estimating they've done around 300. Uh, in the administrative sense, the number who are technically onboarded and able to flow data into the system is much lower than that again. So that's going to be a big bottleneck later in the year, um, and there's no question. So don't leave this till uh, September before you think about it. This is something that should be started now. We can help you with the technical connection. Um, Clearly other providers are available. I don't want this to be too salesy, but um, you know, uh, you'd expect me to say that we can help. We can help guide you on the administration around that as well. So how you actually get this done. So feel free to contact me or, uh, or the general RFX cell details uh, if you wish. And just a few notes on how to choose a software provider. Um, this is not gonna be a sales pitch, so I will keep it light touch. But the important thing is to think about what you're actually trying to achieve. Your secure and efficient supply chain depends on the integrity of your data. This is not some thin layer on top that can be uh, just done and, and forgotten about. This actually changes the way that you do business, as I hope I've demonstrated in the earlier slides. So it's really important to think about this in that holistic sense. And to remember that in a normal supply chain, data flows forwards and backwards. You also have to deal with returns as well and you have to figure out what to do with data that's coming in and out of your system not just the forward push of information so accuracy becomes absolutely vital in how you run these systems and how you get the best value from them and i've talked to regulators across the european union um, usually over cups of coffee at conferences and they all tell me that they are planning to audit these systems and that they're training staff on computer systems validation so this means that uh, it's not something that they're going to just leave on the shelf and hope that it works. They will actually be going out and checking these things. And in those situations, I think it's important to just think about how you configure your 
system for reporting to the regulators. And there's really two main areas, uh, two main uh, paradigms how people do that. The first is to click into a shared system where everybody is on the same instance of software and that is then reporting to a regulator. So you're all sharing a cloud system with other users. We do it slightly differently where we give every customer a private cloud that their information sits in. And I'll come on to the, the technical difference in a moment. That's because we believe that the shared cloud systems have higher risks. It's harder to do data checking. So anything that comes in, which is an error, can go out as an error. Everybody in a multi-shared system is at the mercy of the changes of everybody else. So that means that if someone else, if your system provider makes a change, everybody has to accept that change at the same time on their timetable, not yours. And that means that you have to be constantly alert for risks and validation implications and so on. So the, the control element of shared cloud systems is why we don't do it that way. Because we work from the basis of what would data quality drive us towards and we build our system outwards from that perspective rather than using a more of a convenience driven perspective. In our view, uh, sharing a serialization system with other users is like sharing a bowl of soup. The difference being it's still being cooked by a lot of other people that you don't know. So the changing in flavor of that uh, system is going to happen. The only thing you have control over is your spoon. So just bear that in mind uh, when thinking about how you're going to use the system, how you're going to control the system, and how you're going to maintain quality in the system. Just a quick word on timelines and resources. Um, these things take time. They're computer systems typically. If you're doing a production line system, as I mentioned, you shouldn't still be on the call because you have even more to do. But even if you're just doing a software implementation, that procurement installation validation takes some time and typically we see six to nine months uh, cycle from first contact to go live the piece that we do takes three months typically uh, if everything is lined up so these are finite chunks of time when there's only one year left to get this done so it's important to react and start Validation is critical. As I mentioned, these are systems that will need to be compliant with quality standards. So make sure that whichever system you choose is EU Annex 11 compliant. Um, make sure it stays that way. That means that you need to show that you maintain control. That's the key phrase there really is that the, uh, the owner and the user of the system needs to show that they have control. They need to be able to point to the regulator that they have control of their system at all times when changes are made as well. So in terms of a summary of what you need to do in terms of software, master data is critical. Um, talk to software vendors. Uh, make sure that you uh, introduce them to CMOs um, and, and get cooperation. The biggest delays that we see on projects are when CMOs, for reasons of their own, usually because they're very busy, don't get around to doing the things that they've been requested to do by the marketing authorization holder. So if you can iron out those wrinkles, it makes everything go much more quickly. Think about the EMVO onboarding admin and get the legal stuff started already. Um, these wheels take a while to turn, particularly in medium and large organizations, so it's worth getting on with that. Uh, validation uh, is really important to think about. So um, typically, there's a, it's quite variable what needs to be done. But certainly performance qualification, the, the end piece of the validation cycle, the PQ, if you like, um, is something that you will need to put to your input into. Um, we can help you with that. But clearly, your system is not the software system out of the box. It's the software system as it is being used in your production uh, or your business environment. So the, the PQ is very much uh, a function of the customer environment. So we can't do everything for you. We do need some of your input for that. And just to bear in mind, as I mentioned, that the ongoing validation load varies tremendously with vendors. Uh, we, because we're private cloud, we can lock down the system when we finished, and you only need to change it again when you decide to do so. If you're on an open multi-tenant system, then that change could be occurring tomorrow morning. So again, just think about what you want to do and how you want to control it. 
very brief couple of slides on RFXL. We're coming towards the end of the presentation piece here, and then I'll take some questions. Um, RFXL has been around 15 years. We're actually probably the oldest pure play traceability company in this space. Um, we have a huge bedrock of knowledge and experience. And just at the end of last year, we acquired the assets of Frequence, uh, one of the other um, early players in this space. So we now have uh, an even wider customer base. We work in serialization and supply chain traceability, and also increasingly in environmental monitoring, which I'll briefly come on to in a moment. And we are global. Um, as you can see from the picture, our headquarters is in sunny California. Um, as you can tell from my voice, uh, I'm a Brit, so I live over in the UK uh, with my team over here in Europe as well. And we have a big uh, back office and, uh, and other technical functions in India. So we're, we cover uh, quite a wide number of time zones. We are, as I mentioned earlier, one of the few uh, software providers for serialization that is already EMVO certified. So we've been through those processes of getting ready and getting our software pre-certified so that it's a quicker process for you joining. You can look at these slides uh, afterwards and, and see the details, but as I mentioned, um, serialization is kind of the midpoint. We can also do ingredients traceability, so upstream into APIs, and finished goods supply chain traceability downstream. And uh, that's uh, done on the basis of a very flexible architecture. So we have actually integrated warehouse solutions as well. So if you're a small operation and you have a few pieces of rework that you need to do that isn't doesn't justify a full edge uh, solution in your warehouse. That's something that you can just plug a scanner into a PC and use the RFXL instance to get done. So that's quite a flexible uh, feature that our customers like. You can use any packaging line solution partner. We don't have any ties to any particular partner. We don't have any system dependencies and we can link easily to your contract manufacturing organizations. Whichever system they happen to use. Uh, of course, there are people who don't use RFXL as their uh, cloud system. We respect that entirely. We can link to those people very easily, and we do that on a daily basis. Uh, we make new links, we re establish links with the same supplier. Uh, it's a very easy process for us to get that done for you. Just a quick thought on environmental monitoring. Um, cold chain is a big issue for some companies, and we see serialization as part of a bigger push towards greater control of the supply chain. And we're working with Verizon, huge US telecoms organization, to bring real-time IoT traceability into the supply chain. So not just receiving a temperature sensor at the end of the journey, which says all of your vaccine's worthless because it's been held at 50 degrees, but getting a real-time alert as it starts an incursion to excursion to say this product is going out of its parameters and giving you an alert so you can call somebody, get it moved, and fix the problem before you have to uh, trash the whole uh, batch. So that's going to change the way that we can monitor our products through the supply chain. I'm really excited about the potential for that uh, to save customers a lot of money. Our core infrastructure, as I mentioned, is that we have the uh, the system that I'm circling here is, is your your own system. And then there's a kind of mapping server to the outside world. RF Exchange is our exchange that links all of the outside world inputs into one place. And then that's translated to your system, which stays stable behind its nice little barrier. So that gives us the ability to map data and to check for incoming data errors, which is really important. It means that we can start to sift out things before they become a problem to you rather than letting them get through. So just a summary slide, and I've left 10 minutes or so for anything that you want to follow up on. How to get ready for FMD, and I can't stress this enough, this is the last opportunity to get this done comfortably. And that's assuming that you don't have a production line to get ready. I think if you have a significant production line uh, real estate that you need to convert to serialization and you have not even started that process, I would look for a CMO and start tech transfer because I'm not convinced you've got enough time to change your production lines. There is enough time to get your software done for the level four and level five, the higher level control and reporting systems. Start your EMVO process soon. Um, there's a kind of lull before the storm at the moment. I expect that to get very busy second and third quarter this year. 
choose your connection software vendor. Um, we'd love it for it to be us, of course, but there are other people available, but uh, certainly give us a chance to show what we can do. And look at that from the view of GMP. How do we comply and how do we keep our data quality at the levels that a regulator would expect it to be? And let's make sure that we think about the hidden costs that can sometimes be embedded in different ways of doing things. And just one thing to reiterate, um, you don't need to use the same software provider that your CMO does. The major supplier systems exchange data every day and, and we're no different. We work with all of the other competitors to make sure that our customers exchange information with their customers. So that lockout that is sometimes implied in, in uh, vendor presentations is not true. You can use a different provider quite happily and we'll help you uh, make sure that that's fine. So from my side, um, that's everything that I wanted to present. Um, we do have a few minutes left for some questions. And uh, if anybody has any particular questions, then we can take those. Um, I'm just going to look down through the, the chat screen. I just have a couple. Um, <laughs> so I always get this one as well. Will Brexit make any difference? Um, Brexit will, in my view, make zero difference for a couple of reasons. The first is that the immediate uh, timing of the falsified medicines directive will be before Brexit. And Brexit, uh, the transition period that's built into Brexit of 20 months, obliges the UK to carry on with any rules which are enforced during that period. So for at least two years after the FMD comes into force, uh, Brexit will by law have no effect on its enforcement, the FMD enforcement. So the second reason is the UK is such a big manufacturing country that I would be astonished if they diverge away from the rules that apply in the rest of the European Union. It would be commercially nonsense. And I noticed that um, there's also a kind of related question, um, which is, will the falsified medicines directive be delayed like the FDA delayed the Drug Supply Chain Security Act enforcement? Uh, I don't have a crystal ball on this one. Um, it would be lovely if I did. I think my instinct is it's quite possible that the falsified medicines directive will be delayed if it comes too close to the deadline and a sufficient proportion of companies are not ready. However, I would not like to be the person who had to go to the boss and say, we gambled on it being delayed and it wasn't, and now we can't sell any product for six months till we run to catch up. So it depends on your appetite for risk, I would say. Uh, I definitely wouldn't be playing that particular strategy if it was my company. I think I'd have to go on the basis that FMD will be as is, and if we get more time, that's a bonus, but don't bank on it being delayed. And uh, the flip side of that, again, a question that I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit here, but will everything be ready on 9th of February 2019 for FMD. So our pharmacists are going to be ready, our distribution chain is going to be ready uh, all across Europe. This is one of the biggest IT integration projects in recent years. Nearly 30 countries, the whole pharmaceutical supply chain. Uh, the chances of it being ready 100% on day one are nil, in my view. Uh, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't make best efforts to be there because there is value and we need to get the process as ready as we can be in order for the whole system to be functional. And most people have spent too much money now to let it fail. So I think the, the answer there is it's not gonna be perfect, but it's gonna be a heck of a lot better than we have today. I've just seen this week already cases where pharmacists in busy retail pharmacies had given out the wrong information because they were too busy to read very closely related drug names. If they'd scanned those packs, then it would have come up with uh, the drug name printed out in front of them and it would have given them um, much more information to work on. So taking the human error out of that is important. Another news item that we saw today was around the insertion of millions of fake packs into the UK uh, pharmacy chain, the legitimate supply chain. Again, the point of the falsified medicines directive is to provide a smoke alarm when that happens. So it's not foolproof 
for each individual box, but it will show patterns of behavior that enable us to stamp out that criminal activity much more quickly. So when people say, what's the ROI on serialization? That's the kind of thing that we're talking about. The ability to squeeze out criminals from the legitimate supply chain and to keep our fathers, mothers, kids uh, safe from fake medicines. So with that, I will finish. Uh, I will um, pass over to Shelley for final words, and I thank you all for your time. Thank you, Mark, very much for your uh, very informative presentation. Um, for those of you um, who had sent some questions to me privately as well, I, I do see those here on your screen just for time's sake. Um, if you don't mind, I, I would like to discuss these with Mark after our presentation and go ahead um, and follow up with you um, privately in, in regards to that. I, I truly appreciate all the questions that have, have come across. This is um, wonderful feedback. Um, also, thank you to all of you um, who have attended the presentation for joining us today. If you happen to think of any additional questions, um, please feel free to email Mark directly. He did provide um, his, his email address earlier on the call. Or also, um, we are all available at any time at the email address of hello, H-E-L-L-O, at rfxl.com. Of note, and, and this will address um, a couple of the questions that came across as well, we will be um, sending out a brief five-question survey following the webinar. Um, if you would um, be willing to fill that out and send that out, or send that back to us, rather, we would appreciate you know, any feedback that you would be willing to provide. We also do anticipate um, that we will be able to provide um, a portion of the webinar to you as well. So um, I will work with, with Mark and others here at RFXL, and then we will be pulling something together that we can send out and share with, um, with all of the attendees as well. So again, thank you um, everyone very much for your time today. We hope you, um, we hope that the webinar was valuable and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you again, bye-bye.